Hi there. This is a criminal procedure adjudication video topic uh, linked to Chapter 7, Part A1 in the Miller and Wright text. We're going to be talking here about decision makers at trial. Is it the judge or is it the jury who's going to decide the case? The answer to this question is, comes from a lot of different sources of law. Constitutional law at the state and the federal levels, along with statutes, and practical resource constraints. They all flow together to tell us when the jury is going to be uh, available or when a judge is going to decide a criminal case. Uh, and even when legal doctrine makes a jury available, a defendant sometimes wants to uh, waive the jury. And so we're going to talk about legal availability now, and then we'll save the, the waiver question for later. So here we go. Our illustrative case this time is State v. Bowers from South Dakota in 1993. Uh, so what did Kent Bowers do? Well, he was, uh, he was uh, involved in an abortion protest. Uh, and you see here a uh, picture from a more recent uh, abortion protest, both pro-life and pro-choice uh, protesters present there. Uh, this was a big event in Sioux Falls, uh, uh, South Dakota. So we have 77 police officers showing up to, uh, to enforce the law. The, uh, the protesters are blocking the entrances to the clinic in violation of law. They, the police have their bullhorn and say, if you don't step back, we're going to arrest you. They have videotaping equipment uh, available. Buses are rented to handle all the, the, the crowds that are going to be arrested. Uh, they had set up a press observation area, so this is a, a big event. At the end of this period, Kent Bowers is one of the, uh, the people who are arrested and charged with unlaw unlawful occupancy of property and uh, disorderly assembly. Uh, a, a misdemeanor for the unlawful occupancy and, the, uh, and a city ordinance for the disorderly uh, assembly. So does Kent Bowers get a jury to decide his case? That's what he wants. What does the uh, federal constitution have to say about this? Well, the text would suggest he would get a jury because the text says in all criminal prosecutions, the accused gets an, uh, you know, an impartial jury. But over the years, the court has read that in light of the history, uh, which did, uh, historically we did not provide uh, juries for all offenses. Uh, some offenses were considered petty. Uh, and therefore no jury uh, trial attached to those. So all in the text doesn't really mean all here. So as of uh, 1968 in the Duncan case, uh, the Supreme Court has said that the, uh, the text excludes petty crimes. And then we've had several different cases over the years from uh, the U.S. Supreme Court defining what is the dividing line between uh, petty crimes and the more serious jury uh, crimes. And so now we say that any crime that is punishable not punished necessarily in the case at hand, but punishable by, uh, at, by more than six months in prison will get a jury. Anything that is six months or less uh, is going to be considered petty and no federal constitutional jury trial right attaches to that. Uh, the Supreme Court has also said that, uh, that there might be other factors like a very big fine or other punishments that you might add into the mix when it comes to the, the six months that might push a lesser uh, jail term over the top, but we just haven't run into a case like that. The courts just held out the possibility that it might happen. What happened to uh, Kent Bowers uh, at the trial level? Well, first let me notice note for you that, uh, uh, that we have over uh, on the right of the slide here the, uh, the generations of courthouses in Sioux Falls, uh, South Dakota. So we have the 1892 Romanesque Revival Courthouse. Uh, then we, that one was replaced in 1963 by a more modern structure commemorated here in a postcard. Can you imagine putting your local courthouse on a postcard? They were proud of this structure. Uh, and then that one was uh, replaced in 1996 after the Bowers case with this Bland Revival uh, style courthouse uh, that is the, uh, the courthouse uh, operating there today.
So what happened to uh, Bowers is that the judge declared ahead of time that he was not going to impose an active um, jail term or prison sentence on any of the uh, defendants, including Bowers. Uh, and so he sentenced uh, Bowers, uh, he found him guilty and sentenced him to, uh, to fines primarily. But he also said uh, that uh, I'm going to impose 7 to 14 days of jail time on you suspended. So it's not an active term, but it's suspended. Uh, if you, uh, you're, you're going to stay on probation for a year, if you stay out of, completely out of trouble for a year, then you'll never serve those seven days in, uh, in jail. Uh, the judge also commented that he was concerned that if he were to declare that, uh, that this was a uh, jury trial uh, situation, then that would open a Pandora's box because he says then every class two uh, uh, misdemeanor would, uh, would end up with a uh, jury trial here. Uh, and he says, now theft, that's different. Nobody likes to be called a thief. But, uh, but for this class two offense, the, uh, the uh, unlawful occupation of property, he says, that's just not going to be enough. Otherwise, I'll be handling jury trials all the time. And how does this sentence stack up uh, against the, uh, the federal standard for jury trials? Well, pretty clearly, it is, uh, it is not uh, a, a crime that would lead to a jury trial under the uh, federal constitutional standard uh, because uh, what he's declared is no jail time at all is going to be at issue uh, even if you're looking at the suspended term of 14 days well uh, below the, the dividing line of six months that the federal constitution points out so uh, pretty clear outcome under the federal constitution there would be no jury trial right here So what about the South Dakota Constitution? Does it give a different answer than the federal constitution? Well, the, the South Dakota Supreme Court discusses this. And by the way, we have here the, uh, the South Dakota Supreme Court of today. Look at that mural in the, uh, the hearing room. You don't see that very often in a, uh, in a, a courtroom. At any rate, uh, the South Dakota uh, Supreme Court points to two of its uh, cases uh, that depart a bit from the uh, from the federal standard. So under the Wickle case, uh, the uh, the South Dakota Supreme Court has said that you get a jury for any uh, crime if you're talking about direct incarceration that could be uh, imposed. Uh, but then it declared later, a few years later, four years later, that even though the statutory code might say uh, that uh, that a crime is punishable by uh, some kind of direct incarceration. The judge can take that off the table at the start of the case, as the trial court seemed to do here, and say, I know I could sentence you to some kind of jail sentence, but I'm committing now up front that I'm not going to do that. Therefore, no jury needs to be uh, available. So that was the state of the law in South Dakota at the time. We have here a pretty colorful dissent uh, by Justice Frank Rudy Henderson, who's uh, pictured on your slide here as a, a younger man. He was actually in his mid-60s at the time of this case, uh, but he's pictured here uh, in an earlier photo. So he says, petty baloney. You can imagine him you know, waving his arms around and saying this. Uh, he says, notice how, what a big deal this was in the press, just in practical terms. There was a press observation area. There were seven, you know, they called out every police officer who was on duty or off duty. They rented buses to hold all the people who were going to be arrested. It's kind of crazy, he says, just in practical terms, to call this crime petty, given the, the amount of law enforcement resources and attention that this, uh, that this incident got. He also says, we shouldn't be ignoring probation. That's a year's worth of state control over an individual's freedom, and that makes this you know, a pretty, uh, pretty serious non-petty intrusion uh, into an individual's liberty by the uh, criminal justice system. So his view is that you ought not use the federal dividing line and that he believes this, the South Dakota constitutional standard ought to turn on something more than just how much jail time is involved and should look to a wider range of indicators of seriousness.
Now this is one of those areas where you're going to see a lot of variety in the, uh, in the case law as you go from state to state. So there are a lot of states that say when we're interpreting our state constitution, we will use uh, the federal uh, methodology. Uh, that is, we're going to primarily be looking at the amount of prison, imprisonment that is, uh, that is allowed uh, under, the, uh, under the, the statutory code. And they would use the, uh, the federal triggering amount, which would be anything over six months. So uh, you'll see a number of, of uh, state courts using both the federal methodology and the federal amount. You'll see others that will use the federal methodology, but they'll choose some different amount. They'll say, no, we're going to be triggered by three months instead of six months, or 30 days instead of six months. Obviously, you can't go higher than the federal, uh, the federal amount. Uh, for state constitutional law purposes, but you can trigger a jury trial right more quickly, uh, you know, after fewer months. And then there are state, uh, state courts that will interpret their, uh, their law uh, to look to something other than uh, the, uh, the amount of imprisonment that is at risk under the state code. In other words, they reject the federal methodology that centers on the, the, uh, the amount of incarceration uh, involved. And instead, you just look to other aspects of the case, as, uh, as Justice Henderson was hoping the South Dakota court would do, uh, to consider the, uh, the punitive nature of the penalty, uh, how much uh, notoriety did the case get. Uh, just in general terms, as the trial court here in Bowers said, you know, what do people generally think when you label somebody a thief? That kind of uh, general popular reaction to the crime might have some bearing on the constitutional uh, ruling about a jury trial. Uh, this is also an area where history matters a lot, so a lot of courts will look back to see what kinds of crimes traditionally got a jury trial right, and they'll take their cues today from that historical practice. And there are some uh, state courts that end up saying quite expansively that all uh, offenses uh, get uh, a jury trial, uh, you, you know, resorting to the absolute language of their state constitutions, uh, just as we have absolute language in the federal constitution that is, uh, that is interpreted to, in light of the history to not quite cover everything. Now you might ask yourself, what were the parties hoping for in the Bowers case? In particular, why did Bowers himself want a jury trial here? Was he concerned that the judge would be, um, you know, unsympathetic to uh, to the crime? Was he? Uh, did he believe that the uh, that the jury would give him a more accurate uh, uh, interpretation of the facts? Did he have a better chance of acquittal? Possible that he th that the whole point of the of the exercise, the whole point of the protest, was to create a public dialogue, was to create a public issue. And you get a bigger, you know, kind of public airing of his uh, issue if you have a jury trial right. That is more likely to get the attention of the of the press. Uh, and so, to the extent this is this whole uh, effort of his is trying to prompt public debate about uh, an issue that he sees as important, then you can see that the jury trial right might be part of that larger strategy. Now, what about the prosecutor? Notice that the prosecutor here had some choices. Could have charged this this as a state offense uh, that had the same elements uh, as the uh, as the ordinance when it comes to disorderly assembly, uh, and then the potential punishment would have been one year, and you clearly would have had a jury trial right. So the prosecutor here was making uh, making choices that uh, were definitely going to, or at least increase the odds that we were going to keep the uh, keep the case out of the jury trial arena and it, make it a uh, bench trial. So this is often true that a prosecutor has some ability to control uh, whether we're going to be talking about judge or, uh, or jury. You might ask, should a constitutional standard uh, try to account for these different strategic motives of the parties, defense or prosecution side? This is also an area where statutes play a very important role. You have before you here a Maryland statute uh, that says uh, to defendants that if that you will have an initial bench trial for the smallest of crimes, but this defendant may appeal from the final judgment uh, in the uh, in the lower court, 
and then the appeal up to the, uh, the felony level trial court shall be tried de novo. Same is true in uh, North Carolina where uh, misdemeanors can be appealed and so what's called a misdemeanor appeal is actually a trial de novo in the uh, superior court. Uh, and you see this in a number of, of states where the, the statute provides for a for broader access to jury trial uh, rights than the uh, than the state or the federal constitutions would uh, and then you might ask well how can the state afford this and you know part of the answer is that prosecutor uh, charging decisions still have some uh, effect on the availability of the jury trial right even under some of these statutes uh, and waiver a topic that we have yet to talk about uh, is an important part of this. A lot of defendants just waive this jury trial right even though it's quite uh, expansive and they waive it in exchange for getting some kind of sentence, uh, you know, some kind of sentencing break. So that brings us to the end of this topic, the availability of the, uh, of the jury trial right. Um, it's a wonderful example of, of, uh, of a right that is influenced by several different sources of law, the federal constitutional law uh, with a layer of state constitutional law and a heavy layer of state statutory coverage, uh, each of them with different uh, boundary lines for when they declare the uh, jury trial available, and then all of that processed by parties with their own uh, particular interests uh, and strategies in a given case, the uh, available resources that all of the parties are watching as they uh, interpret these uh, these uh, statutory and constitutional provisions. So on we go now, next topic.